Welcome, all of Today we are speaking about my favorite uh, archaeological find from the Viking Age, the Orsaberg ship. Why is it my favorite? Uh, not only because it's the most well-preserved ship and one of the richest burials from the Viking Age, but it's the most spiritual and we can learn the most about the religion, beliefs, uh, religious leaders, and even magic by looking at this burial if we have some knowledge of the written sources and, you know, um, pre-Christian religious beliefs from around the world, uh, which most archaeologists don't have, by the way. Um, this is not a massive warrior's grave of a king, but it's a grave of two women. Two women that got a burial fit for a king, two women that were vulva, or witches, or shamans, or healers, whatever you want to call it, two incredibly wealthy and honored women that were loved by all and they were possibly uh, royalty. I've been looking forward to share this history with you guys for a long time, but finally got around to actually visiting this beautiful burial mound just near my home in Norway, and I'm going to be going over all the details and what we can learn from it as modern Norse pagans. So most uh, things about the Orsabag ship um, is a hotly debated uh, topic actually. Mostly about who these two women were and what they did. Uh, I'm gonna go over all the evidence and theories and what I believe is the most likely explanation. Uh, but first, let's talk about the general facts that we know. Uh, first, speaking about when is it dated to, how old is it? Uh, dating of the ship um, suggests that it was buried no later than the year 834, although certain parts of it, uh, of its structure, um, date to as early as 800, while other parts and also items in the uh, burial mound date to uh, even older than that, possibly much older. So we're talking about the early Viking Age here, um, and but like I said, possibly uh, this site could have been a much older sacred site that was visited by people, and then in the early Viking Age they decided to bury these two women there. Um, also, uh, it was broken into about 100 years after the burial, as I'll explain in a bit. Next important thing we speak about um, is the ship. So the original ship is actually kept at the famous Viking Ship Museum in Oslo. Uh, however, it has been closed for construction and it's not going to be opening for another couple of years. It's been really closed for a long time, which sucks. But if you are in Oslo, you can actually check out something called the Viking Planet. It's a kind of virtual experience uh, type of museum. You can get a full immersive view of this museum on screen and the Osabay ship. So that is what you will be seeing in this video here. Um, the ship is what's called a Kalve. That's the type of ship with a uh, medium speed, a relatively small ship, clinker built, and it's almost entirely of oak. It is 21 and a half meters long, so about 70 feet and um, 5.10 meters uh, uh, wide with the mast that was on there of approximately 9 to 10 meters. Um, so even though that is pretty big, it's not a massive ship um, uh, in comparison to the main ships we hear from the Viking Age. It's not a massive ship that would be meant for the long ocean journeys or warships, for example, but the Ulsa Bay ship would be for shorter trips along the coasts or up rivers and things like that. Of course, we don't have any really big ships buried, though, um, because that would be incredibly difficult to carry those up onto land and dig a hole big enough uh, to bury those and then a mound. Uh, but the Ulsa Bay ship is a decent sized uh, one, and it is one of the most beautiful with complex wood carvings known as the Ulsa Bay style. Um, this is that nut work that is so famous that you have seen in many Viking uh, uh, designs uh, that you might see around the world. So we can say this as a ship was possibly owned and used by these women to take short journeys into coastal towns and to make a grand arrival to impress. And of course, most of you know already, uh, people in the Viking Age and actually most uh, pre-Christian religions, they were buried or cremated with ships uh, sometimes to make their trip into the afterlife. And in the Norse beliefs, um, uh, this ship would help transport them over the river uh, Jörl. 
uh, into hell. This would, so the ship was buried or cremated with them to get that done quicker. See my dear video I did on Norse funerals there. Um, but of course not everyone could have a ship burial because that's a real big hassle. So only the most important people would receive this uh, so that they make their journey through the afterlife quicker and more efficient. Next, let's talk about the people who are buried in the uh, Ulsebag ship, uh, the skeletons. Two women, one of them was aged about 80 years old at the time of death, and one was originally thought to be her slave, who was aged no older than 30, uh, who was sacrificed with her at her death, but recent evidence uh, suggests that the second woman was uh, older, she was about 50, and she was actually not sacrificed, um, so they would have died at the same time of natural causes, most likely. Uh, there were also, in this um, uh, burial mound, skeletal remains of 14 horses, an ox, and three dogs found on the ship. So these were for sure uh, all sacrificed with the two women. Uh, as you know, the animals were sacrificed to accompany women to the realm of the dead to be used and make use of them to make that journey more efficient as, uh, as we keep coming back to. Um, so the real question is, that is hotly debated, who were these women? Why were they so important? Was one a slave? Who was the other one? Um, was she royalty? Were both of them witches? Were they spiritual leaders? Were they related maybe? Were they co-workers? What's the deal with all that? Well, there are lots of theories. Um, the first one is that the older woman was a queen and the younger one was her servant. Um, it's even proposed that we actually know who this older woman buried was, and that was uh, Queen Orsa Haraldsdottir, um, uh, the mother of Halfdan the Black and grandmother of Harald Fairhair, who was a beautiful princess that was kidnapped and um, got married uh, to her kidnapper against her will. Um, the time frame and location definitely lines up um, in the written sources we have of her. The problem with that theory is, uh, again, I'm not saying what I believe yet. Um, I'm just going over the evidence um, that they have uh, put forward about this uh, burial. The problem is we found that the older woman through DNA testing has been shown to have Morgagni syndrome. So that would have made it look like she was beat with a big ugly stick, okay? Like obesity, like the kind of deformities possibly, and excessive hair all over the body, even a beard and masculine appearance. Those are some of the symptoms of uh, Morgagni's uh, syndrome. Okay, if that's true... There's nobody that would have tried to kidnap her and marry her against her will if that was the case. I'm saying if that was true, I'm not saying I believe it, uh, but if that was the truth, that, uh, yeah, that would probably not make her uh, or Queen Orsa Harald's daughter. However, though, one interesting thing is this syndrome that she was supposed to have also brings other mental and neurological disorders that makes... The second option possible, which is what I'll speak about in a minute, that she was a spiritual leader. So I'll come back to that. Um, I'm not a fan of DNA tests, and I don't know what I believe here. Um, they're just too unreliable most of the time. Uh, who knows if she actually had this syndrome? If she did, it is possible. Maybe she had no symptoms of it, um, or maybe they perhaps developed later into life as she got older. Uh, but Queen Orsa was definitely a beautiful woman <laughs> when she was young, not fat and bearded. Uh, I don't know. I'm just presenting the evidence here. You guys can uh, form your own beliefs based on... Um, the evidence but the second younger woman we don't know much about um, but again there's a DNA test um, that showed that her DNA sample fell into the haplogroup U7 uh, from the maternal side which is commonly found in Iran and South uh, Western Asia area so she could have been from the east or at least her mother could have been from the uh, east uh, Iran Persia India area like you see here again DNA test results are not reliable, especially since this sample, after that first time it was tested, it was tested three more times and nothing like that was found. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's also some other evidence that she did come uh, from the East, uh, which I will cover. All I'm saying, guys, is don't trust DNA.
DNA tests. Uh, they are not reliable and they usually always seem to fit the agenda of the ones who are funding them. Uh, so we have to look at all the evidence, DNA tests included, and then you can form your own beliefs. Just don't believe the first thing that you read. And that's why I'm making this video here, because a lot of stuff that you guys find about the Ulta Bay ship online um, in the mainstream news articles, um, they leave out a bunch of stuff. Um, so we're just looking at all angles uh, in this ship. What do I think? I think it's very clear. Um, just from the archaeological finds uh, that these women were vulva, they were shamans, they were spiritual leaders, they were practitioners of Saidir, as it would have been called in Old Norse. Uh, was the older woman royalty? Yes, I do think uh, it is. If I had to put my money on it, I would say she was Queen Orsa, just the location, the time uh, uh, lines up. And if she did have Morgogni syndrome, it would have been a mild case. Uh, she probably wouldn't have looked too ugly like full-blown syndrome but she would have had other neurological symptoms that were common in this um in this disorder things such as schizophrenia uh, seizures uh, vertigo you know these so-called symptoms um that many spiritual leaders or shamans around the world are diagnosed with these things make it much easier if you're having a bit of schizophrenia, if you're dizzy, if even if you're seizing up like that. This is exactly what people experience when they get into this trance state to whatever, contact other realms, contact spirits. Again, believe whatever you want. I'm just saying these types of things were believed all around the world. Uh, and I'm saying that's what I believe. The second woman, I believe she was from the East. Uh, she was possibly Iranian mainly due to the unique items that we find in this uh, burial. Um, I'm not just relying on one of the four DNA tests that um, say she was maybe uh, uh, from the east. But yeah, that's what I think. These were shamans, Verva, with a very interesting blend of Norse and a little Sami style mixed with Eastern mysticism. And the items we're going to speak about are going to show that pretty clear here. Uh, I'm not going to go over all the items found in the grave because there was a number of tools and everyday items with no significance. But I'm just going over the key finds um, that tell us who these women were and what they did. Number one, the most common was the wooden staff. Maybe the most common tool for any shaman or spiritual leader around the world. Um, this isn't spoke about much because the one uh, that was found in the Usabai ship was pretty poorly preserved. Uh, but what we know is that it was made of birch wood. It was uh, tall, uh, about eight feet long. There were runes carved into it, but the only ones that um, we can make out, or that they could make out when they found it, was this words right here, Litluism, which is not any Old Norse word or any other language, so we don't know what that word means. But uh, the Norse, of course, used kind of uh, these runes in code uh, with secret meanings um, and many of their spiritual tools. So there you go. Uh, those were the only runes preserved, but there was probably more... Um, more originally but again the the the, the staff was so poorly preserved uh, we just don't know now what staffs uh, mean spiritually and how they were used long subject for another video uh, and there's also a book on staves in the Viking Age, and I'll link that below if you are interested in that but I will do another video on those uh, next we can speak about what these two women were wearing. Uh, the uh, older woman wore a very fine red wool dress with a twill pattern and she also wore a very nice uh, white linen veil and a gauze weave. Then um, those were all considered luxury items of the time. The second younger woman was wearing a blue woolen dress um, with a wool veil. A slightly lower class item, but not uh, considered slave apparel by any means. Um, so there would have been some difference in social class possibly between these two women, but it wasn't like a slave master uh, relationship. Um, uh, I think they were both free and wealthy women. I think that is pretty clear from the finds. Then we have the famous Usabeg uh, dragon head. 
the best preserved dragon head of all the Viking ships that we've found. However, it's important to note that this was separate and detachable. Um, you could put it on the ship or you can take it away. They just didn't sail everywhere with dragon heads on their ships um, like they had do in the movies um, because this would frighten the land spirits, the Lundvetter. The dragon heads would have to be covered or just removed completely when you were sailing home to your own homeland and that was uh, attested in Lundnamabuk. Or perhaps these dragon heads were used um, to do magic, even place curses on others by intimidating the land spirits um, to do the curse for you because the land spirits were intimidated by this dragon head just like was done in Egil Saga. So a little spiritual magic info there for you. Also super interesting, a quick note. Uh, uh, there were apples and berries and bread preserved, incredibly well preserved in this ship. When they opened the grave more than a thousand years later, in the early 900s, they found apples that were still red. This is because um, the, the fruits and breads and stuff, they were packed in uh, peat and clay uh, to be preserved. So were these things a food item to bring to the afterlife or was this a little bit more mystical? We don't know. Uh, then we have... Also, some famous uh, uh, elaborately decorated uh, sleighs. Four of them were found. Okay, we know the use for those. Norway snows sometimes, and if they were traveling around a lot, they needed to carry their things easily during the winter. But look at this beautiful design of the traditional Norse knotwork. This is just a super beautiful and iconic find here. We also have the famous cart. Um, again, it's to transport them and their belongings, but possibly also to perform Saider on. Now, Saider was a sort of shamanic ritual. For those of you who don't know, uh, Saider in all the Norse sources was performed on some sort of raised platform. In a couple sources, they couldn't even do the Saider until they built a platform to practice it on, like a makeshift uh, one, and this would have taken some time. So with the cart, these women could travel from town to town and set up um, their platform immediately and get up on there and practice uh, Saider. If you don't know what Saider is, I've done a bunch of videos on that, no time to go over it uh, here. Uh, then we have bedposts with the Valknut symbol. Um, the bed, and that, that bed is actually where they both laid down, by the way. Uh, this famous symbol that is found a few other places um, in the Viking Age. Without a doubt, a very important symbol or uh, ritual uh, symbol or tool. But we don't know exactly what it means or even what it was called. Valknut is just a modern theory of what it might have been called. Um, but they, uh, they, they, for some reason, and they felt the need to place the Valknut on their bedpost. Why? Well, don't know. We have some wooden chests. That's not that significant, but I thought I'd include it just because they are beautiful. In very interesting one. Cannabis seeds. Uh, on the older woman, a leather pouch was on her with cannabis seeds in it. Did she like to light up a little dank stogie at the end of the day to chillax? Uh, no, of course. This was, uh, again, another thing, just another uh, tool to help a spiritual leader get into the altered state that would make ritual practices easier. Just how common was smoking weed in the Viking Age? Well, we don't know. Um, they probably weren't all smoking fat blunts in the meat hall. Uh, this is the only archaeological find with cannabis seeds that I'm aware of. I think other places we found like hemp, uh, clo the hemp that they used to make clothing. Um, but, but it's really not uh, much other than that that we found in the archaeology and um, no written sources of it easier. So uh, it was probably rare and not used by the general public regularly, probably just spiritual leaders that, you know, smoked a little bit or light the seeds on fire to, to, get, to help them get to that trance state to, to practice their uh, rituals. Next part, very, very important, the tapestries and the many, many, many different textiles. The Ulzebaik uh, burial contained the largest and most varied collection of textiles and textile tools that has been found from the time. 
Guys, yeah, I can do a whole video just on these textiles and the designs that were found in this burial. As a matter of fact, there is a whole book dedicated to only looking at the textiles from the Ulsebag ship. It's a book only in Norwegian, but I'll link it below for those of you who can read. But to sum up the importance of these uh, textiles, spinning and weaving, simply. Of course, uh, these textiles, they were high-valued goods in the Viking Age. Everyone would pay top dollar for a woven tapestry or clothing. Uh, so there were traded items too, demonstrating the women's wealth. But more importantly, uh, many spinning tools were found in there too. Whirls with and without attached spindles and several loose spindles showing that spinning and weaving was a big part of their profession and what they did. Weaving and spinning, good lord. I don't even know where to start with that. Um, I would argue that there is no more spiritual uh, practice that you can do other than spinning and weaving. I, out of all the spiritual practices, I think spinning and weaving, I would put as number one. There's so many sources from the Norse texts in the Norse world and all around the world uh, about how spinning had to do with magic, uh, divination, altering fate, life, death, uh, birth, uh, healing, cursing, all these things so much that it's going to take an hour long video. But keep an eye out for that. I will do one on that soon. Uh, but for the sake of time, uh, we will move on here. Rattles we also found. These are very, very cool. Uh, there are many forms of rattles from around the world, but check these out. These are the ones found in the Ulsebag ship. Uh, you also saw a replica of these if you watched the Northman movie. <laughs> so whether it's a maraca from South America or these kinds of rattles from North America that the shamans use there or the ones that Siberian shamans use, they're used all over the world. This is our Norse version of the rattle. The purpose all around the world is generally um, in the same sphere. Rattles are used during various ceremonies and rituals to break up and loosen the energy in the area, okay? Uh, think of it like uh, making one act here so that it loosens up something here. It's a perfect example of sympathetic magic. You loosen up the area, you rattle it up, you rattle up all the particles so that whatever... Um, magic you were doing um, everything there was more moldable it was broken up it was moldable so whatever magic or or effect you were looking for and looking to do after that um, that would be more uh, effective easier to move easier to alter things whether that may be healing or cursing or whatever and then that's another long subject uh, but that's the basics of it it's a it's all about um, sympathetic magic using these rattles we also have the Buddha bucket, the famous bucket with uh, Buddha sitting in his lotus position. Two things we can learn from this. Uh, first is that they uh, had some influence from the east, uh, but potentially they even traveled there. Or as the second younger woman, uh, she may have even been from there. So they would have at least had some eastern spirituality and mysticism in their practice. If not from both of them, from, then from at least the younger woman uh, who, who would have taught it. Um, second, uh, they would have been familiar with eastern meditation and used things like lotus position and things like that. And even the swastika here. Uh, these uh, going both ways as we have found in other uh, Viking Age native uh, finds. Uh, so it's all kind of the same thing and it ties back together. Also, of course, um, it could be used as a bucket to carry things or to mix their potions um, and also possibly used as a drum. We have found other archaeological finds of buckets with drumsticks in them and in the Sami tradition um, uh, drums and buckets are, are almost interchangeable. See my video that I did on that so it could have been a drum too also used for spiritual practices. Then we have imported silks and those were dated, to, um, a lot of them dated to quite a bit uh, before the rest of the items uh, uh, from the Ulsebag burial. There was no silk in Scandinavia, so these were imported from the east, 
possibly through many generations before. So these women were not the first to come in contact with the Far East at all. Finally, the last part of the video, we'll speak about the grave robbery. We'll call it a grave robbery. Uh, there have been other items found in the burial mound that are dated to about a hundred years after um, the actual burial happened. Uh, also, and, uh, there in the side of the burial mound, there was an opening going into it uh, that we can see people dug into. And what we found there, those uh, more recent finds, was uh, several stretchers and wooden spades. Uh, of course, these were used to dig into the burial mound and transport whatever or whoever in or out of the burial mound. But this was not a grave robbery. Uh, what they found is that it was a too large scale a task to be grave robbers and there was far too much effort to destroy things in there uh, as opposed to simply stealing them. Um, and there was also items displaced. They threw them around like the bones from the women, for example, were taken and thrown out all over the place. Um, and very little, uh, if anything, seems to be stolen out of the burial mound. As I mentioned before, uh, digging into uh, the burial mounds was a common practice in the Viking Age, and it seems to be a very important spiritual or initiation ritual. The evidence about this burial, you know, it's not clear enough to know exactly why this was done here, but I covered that in a great video, and you can look at all the possibilities and decide for yourself why you think this was done in different uh, situations, because uh, it wasn't all just for one uh, thing, one reason. But that's all I'll say for now. Hope you enjoyed the video. It's my favorite archaeological find of the whole Viking Age. I hope I convinced some of you to make it your favorite uh, too. It's not a, all about warriors and kings and battle in the Viking Age. No, they were very important women too. And they functioned as like spiritual leaders and upholders of tradition. And I think this is a big problem that faded away. It had faded out of society in the late Viking Age. And this has lasted all the way until today, guys. Before in time, women, uh, it was their job and they could achieve the most honorable status and be remembered long after their death with these great burials. It's because they were so important and valuable, providing spiritual guidance, healing, uh, being upholders of tradition and ancient wisdom. All those things were made illegal when Christianity came in and they would be burned for doing those things that they were so honored for for many thousands of years. Um, but I wish today more women would find their way back to that tradition and function in the society as like kind of spiritual leaders. I think that's what's one of the things they are really great at um, and what of their like more ancient primal natural uh, gifts are as opposed to men. I think women are much more able to get into these <clears throat> states and ancient wisdoms and and uh, help people like that uh, but that's just me hope you enjoyed the video that's all for today there will be more coming from norway soon but hope you enjoyed these sites